what do you think? Shall we go ahead and start? Oh, and there's Rachel. All right, we got plenty now. So I'll call the meeting to order. It's 6.32. Um, and the meeting tonight, the focus is going to be primarily on the strategic planning uh, report out from Winton. And um, we also are going to be appointing the, the auditor. That should be pretty straightforward. Um, and we need uh, a meeting evaluator for this meeting. Do we have any? Volunteers. No one's jumping on it. <laughs> Chelsea will. <laughs> okay. So and and that uh, the evaluation stuff was sent out with the with the meeting packet. If you want to find one of the the evaluation forms. Okay, so um, we're going to start with community engagement. Um, and before I open it up, I'm just going to acknowledge that we did have a couple of emails that came through. Lane uh, responded to one, and the other one, all the board members saw um, saw that email. There was no particular question. It was just a, a community member expressing um, their views on on an issue. Um, and so I'm going to open it up for uh, community engagement. If we have any folks who want to bring something up to our attention. Don't see anything. Anything looks like uh, the people that we have here are either board members or um, part of the design. Move on then. To um, the to our board management and governance, and I just wanted to check in with folks uh, with the board training. Does, is everybody um, logged in and? been able to get started with a policy governance training any any issues with it everybody's on okay perfect um so i think we'll go ahead and start with uh winton and the report out on the strategic plan okay well it's nice to nice to be with you again and I don't think all of my team is here tonight as well, so we'll uh, we'll work with the with the folks that uh, that are with us. I just want to thank the board for the opportunity uh, to present the final strategic plan. Uh, the design team members have been working very diligently since early January. Uh, we've had upwards to 15 meetings, uh, and none of them have been short. And there's always been a lot of homework uh, in advance of that. Uh, we received feedback um, on both past and future direction for the school district from uh, students, from teachers, from staff, administrators, parents, alumni, business owners, and citizens. Uh, feedback was gathered using online forums, surveys, and directly from administrators and previously from the board. Uh, I just want to kind of set the context that the plan is very, very ambitious. It provides direction for the delivery of education services for the next three years uh, for OSSD. And as you can see, there are four main goals with multiple objectives. And since I presented last time, we've done some reconfiguration uh, and we're cognizant that there, there were a lot of goals. We've turned those into objectives with action steps and with benchmarks. And the design team has worked diligently with the superintendent and the administrative cabinet uh, to simultaneously align the strategic plan with the Agency of Education's COVID recovery plan requirements. Uh, the plan provides direction for four main stakeholder groups. Uh, the first group is, of course, the school board. And the most effective board role will be to monitor the plan progress through your ENDS policies. The board's end policy role is most prominently identified 
in goal number one, uh, continue strengthening school culture and climate, and goal three, build student capacity to acquire foundational knowledge. The second stakeholder group is the superintendent and administrative cabinet. Their role will be to operationalize and implement the plan and to ensure progress is being made on our, all four goals and on the 20 objectives. The third stakeholder group includes teachers and staff. They're responsible for the delivery of the plan components to students. And the fourth, and we'll call this the consumer group, are students, families, and the community. And these partners will enjoy uh, the benefits of the school district completing the plan and will also hold the uh, OSSD accountable during plan implementation. Uh, my colleagues, some of my colleagues from the design team will now take you through uh, the process and explain how each component of the strategic plan was developed and will provide a little bit of personal insight. I don't know, Lane, if uh, you have the ability to uh, project uh, the vision, mission, beliefs, and, and the four goals so that uh, board members can see what we're talking about it as the speaker is is taking us through here. Um, yeah, I can give it a give it a try. It might be a little difficult um, during the time that I'm the speaker, but it'll take me a moment to pull up the documents. Well, if you can just allow me, I have it. I just don't know uh, if I'm able to present. Oh, you should be able to. All right. Uh, how do I get to that point? I'm used to running these meetings myself, but I don't know how to share when I'm oh, present. So they, cha they changed the icons on us since the last time I, I used Google Meet. So if you go down to the bottom, it's about the fifth icon over. It looks like an envelope with an up arrow in it. That's the present now button. Okay, on the far right-hand side? Um, on my screen, it's on the bottom. Okay, and then it's, there you go, and you got it. Okay, all right. Well, David, uh, David Roller will start us off tonight with the with the vision piece. So, so the vision, and um, uh, I don't mind reading it to you because it's short, and that's kind of the point. So, it's it's a path for all to learn, think, grow, and achieve. Um, in developing this, the design team went through a fairly large number of iterations and 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 many of them were much longer than this but uh, we wanted it to be a nugget that um, that someday if you asked someone certainly an employee what our vision was that they might actually be able to come up with this or a reasonable facsimile so um, um, we're pleased with this version and think it really represents what we want to do what every, all of our stakeholders want us to be doing for the community Okay, thank you, David. Lisa, we'll take us through the the mission. Yeah, so um, we spent a lot of time distilling all of the information that we got from the stakeholders through the forums, through the surveys, and really thought about what the mission of our school community is. And so um, I think this was the piece that we maybe wordsmithed as a group the most um, and went back and forth on, but ultimately we felt pretty satisfied um, that this represents what we hope to do as a school community. And so I can read the mission, although I know you all can see it. Um, the OSSD is a learning community that empowers students of all backgrounds to discover and pursue their unique passions, build diverse relationships, and develop their knowledge and skills for purposeful futures and successful adults and citizens, as successful adults and citizens. Um, we just felt that even though it's a very long sentence, it really um, encompassed what what we feel our true mission is. Beautiful, thank you. And Haley is set to, um, I think you know that David is a Randolph administrator and, and Lisa is as well in the middle school. Uh, Haley is a Brookfield elementary teacher. And Haley will talk with us a bit about uh, the belief statements. So I have the belief statements, which are much longer than the other two. So I'm not going to read them all to you, <laughs> um, but they're there. And I think that you guys have seen them previously. So uh, we um, looked at the belief statements and kind of chose what 
helps us shape our education decisions and how they're made. It's kind of overarching of how we act every day. Um, and we definitely looked at the survey results to help us um, pinpoint some different belief statements even. Um, they're not really in order, but we did put um, the educators, we did put that one first um, because that was some feedback that we received. We really wanted to focus on um, education and personal learning plans and things like that. So that's the first belief statement. Um, and then there were some other ones that I wanted to highlight. The environmental stewardship was one that came out of our um, survey results. And um, then there was one other, the transferable skills, G was another one that came out of our survey results that um, we took into account. Great. And uh, if board members would just remind Brian that it was his feedback that uh, caused this one to become first, uh, let him know that we really did listen to, uh, to uh, board feedback. All right, Lane, Lane will talk with us a bit about goal one. And I just want to share with the board before we jump into this one that um, we did some kind of late, uh, late changing. These used to be themes and uh, we were very cognizant of the fact that we had 23, I think, goals, and that's a whole lot. Uh, so we've turned it into four main goals with a lot of strategic objectives. And so Lane is going to take us through uh, the first one. Lane, you're muted. Yeah, we can't hear you, Lane. Sorry about that. There, there are four main goals, um, and each one is kind of codified by the strategic objectives that 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 really define uh, what each of those goals are about. Um, goal one uh, deals with uh, continuing to strengthen the school culture and climate. And I think if you think about any organization um, at its foundation. Um, especially if it's a healthy program or organization, there's climate and there's culture. And they support the organization's mission and they enable it to achieve its stated goals. Um, a proper climate enables high levels of human performance um, by ensuring that faculty, students, and families are satisfied with the OSSD and its schools. And a poor climate can hinder achievement um, while well, a positive climate obviously can stimulate it. Um, there are five strategic objectives designed to strengthen school culture and climate. Two are focused specifically on climate. And the first is ensuring that all students have access to learning resources, materials, and the learning environment. And the second is ensuring that our facilities support our learning priorities. Um, Success in terms of these two objectives empowers equity and guarantees that the OSSD structure support our long-term goals. Um, culture is a little bit, of diff little bit different, but related. Um, culture relates to the expectations and standards an organization holds its members to and the values that those expectations inspire over time. Poor performance and organizational failure are often rooted in a mismatch between expectations and stated values. When organizational expectation and values are in harmony, a district can excel. Two of the five strategic objectives spoke, focus specifically on culture. The first is uh, our work to continue closing the student achievement gap. And the second is to create a task force um, to study the middle school grade and program configurations. And to me, the second is really an extension of the first as it also seeks to improve uh, the achievement gap that exists in this case between students in the middle school grades and the rest of the student body. In a positive culture, success becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because members are inspired not only towards their own excellence, but also to push for excellence from their peers. The final strategic objective uh, under this goal, um, the fifth one, actually supports both goal categories, um, and that is to assess school culture and climate from the perspective of students, teachers, and families. Um, this information is going to be important as it's going to represent the evidence for how well our work on climate and culture is producing the desired results. Uh, and there are several popular surveys whose contents can be shaped to measure this ongoing work. And it's hoped that the entire community will participate um, as these are administered over time, as it will give us a means to measure our progress longitudinally. So 
Um, that's the, the, the big one, um, continuing to strengthen school culture and climate. Okay, and I'll just add to that, that uh, from the last presentation, uh, I realized that we didn't uh, as overtly address the task force to study middle school configurations. Uh, we talked about it tangentially, uh, but it didn't, it didn't have a strong uh, focus in the plan. So we made a, a change since the last board meeting, and that's uh, what you'll see here. All right, Lindsay is going to, uh, Lindsay Hopt is going to uh, take us through uh, goal two. Lindsay is a Braintree elementary parent and business owner. Lindsay, take us, uh, take us away with communications. Yes, I, I'm not going to turn my camera on because my internet's not working great, but I'm hoping you can all hear me. <laughs> Um, so uh, thank you all for the opportunity to, uh, to do this. It was really neat to get to work with so many different people and um, to be able to kind of learn so much from everybody. Um, I'm going to introduce a little bit about goal number two, which is improving communication and relationship be um, building between the school and the community. Um, and the main objective um, is just that, to improve two-way communication um, between families and schools. Um, we had a lot of feedback, both um, in survey format as well as in um, our individual um, forums, just about all aspects of the communication um, between, you know, families and students in the schools and, um, you know, the desire for parents to sometimes have more intel on what's going on and more understanding of the systems that are used in the school so that when their children are being evaluated by them, they get that. And so... Um, it was kind of a big task to figure out how to encompass all of that communication piece into sort of measurable goals. Um, one of the things we learned this year was that the surveys seemed to work well um, from determining things for the hybrid and that sort of stuff. And there were a lot of people that enjoyed being able to have that sort of input and communication. So um, you'll notice that some of what we're going to look to do is to put out some various surveys to first learn what are the forms of communication that um, families are looking for um, and the school is looking for um, and, and kind of how can we make um, a two-way communication system work. Um, and then from there, looking at ways to provide both the teachers and the families um, with good communication around the learning management system so that, again, families can um, have a better idea of how to get onto that system and monitor how their children are doing um, during that time. Um, as well as communicating the curriculum and learning outcomes and um, helping families to know where the school stands, kind of like the board is looking to have that same information. And so trying to provide that information to the families as well. Um, similarly, helping um, families and students understand the standard-based learning and, again, how that's used, where the information is taken to, how the um, data is gotten. Um, and that's something else that we're looking to um, enhance that information. Um, and then uh, developing continuity and curriculum implementation across all the schools. That was especially something that was sort of brought up at the elementary level. And then how that's going to help kids transition into middle school um, and high school altogether. Um, so again, looking at some different ways to kind of build that um, community and network at, at the elementary levels. Um, and so you'll see that, you know, using various forms of surveys and things, the goal will be to kind of glean families and students and teachers um, and staff as to whether or not the communication is working and um, as to whether or not they feel confident in these systems. And that's how the board will be able to hopefully use those survey information to determine if um, the objectives have been met. Um, so, yeah, I think that kind of covers most of that. And, um, of course, on the other side, you'll see who exactly is kind of responsible for um, implementing those things as well. Beautiful. Thank you, Lindsay. And now we'll move on to Lisa. I mean, I'm sure you know Lisa is the middle school uh, administrator. Lisa is going to talk with us about uh, building student capacity around foundational knowledge. And this is one of the key uh, board ends policy areas. And you'll see that the board is prominently displayed here as far as responsible for monitoring progress. Uh, take, yeah. it, take it away, Lisa. Yeah, so this is one of our larger categories and it really, um, it covers a lot of territory um, because it's really the heart of what we do as a school. Um, so the very first um, piece of this goal or implementation step is um, 
<clears throat> making sure that we're implementing research-based instructional strategies in all classrooms. So some of these things are going to sound really familiar um, because some of them, the work has already been begun, um, but we're going to continue to strengthen those systems and practices as we follow this strategic plan. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things we hope to do and, and that we found, again, aligning with Lindsay's curriculum, not curriculum, but communication that she just shared about, is create opportunities for families to see the work that's been been happening in schools. So providing periodic family nights to educate parents on how they can support student learning and on what's happening at school we think would be helpful in that regard. Um, in addition to that, assessing the impact of the initiatives. So for example, um, we just did a big responsive classroom training last year. Um, and so looking at ways that we can um, assess the effectiveness of what teachers have learned through um, a variety of data points. So that may be discipline data, it might be um, student assessment scores, um, really using that data with our grade teams in order to analyze proficiency and the effectiveness of the professional development that's been happening. Um, and then 3B is vertically and horizontally aligning curriculum. So again, this speaks to communication within our schools um, and really making sure that the curriculum is cohesive and that each piece builds on each other piece um, and that we create opportunities for students to transfer learning that they gather in one classroom setting to another classroom setting to the world beyond the classroom. Um, this also includes the development of habits of work, heart, and mind, um, which I think occur in all of our schools, but really intentionally um, helping students understand when they're using those transferable skills and building those transferable skills um, so that they're just really well prepared for each phase of their lives. Um, 3C includes increasing the number of students achieving proficiency on the English language arts, math, and science standards. So in math and um, in literacy, this includes hiring district level directors who cover um, our district K-12 and help work on curriculum with administrators and teachers um, and help oversee the intervention program. So this year um, we've had a literacy interventionist working with us um, in grades six through high school. Um, and next year we'll also have a math interventionist working with us at the high school. And I know that they have interventionists at the elementary level as well. So when, when we use the data to see that students are not performing as expected, then we can work with those people um, to move their learning forward. So that's really exciting in terms of um, this foundational knowledge goal. Um, conducting regular student assessments is a really important piece of this because if we don't have the data to build on or to learn from, um, then it becomes challenging to know which areas we need to support more. Um, and then when we identify weaknesses, um, providing professional development so that teachers can gain strength in how to support students in a particular area and build capacity around that um, as a system and a more targeted approach. Um, also, this speaks to um, using best practices in the classroom and continuing professional development. There's a lot of detail in this section, so I'm sorry if it feels like um, I'm going through it really, really quickly. If you have the written copy, I do recommend um, reading it because we really thoughtfully pulled from the survey and forum data to create this. And I think it's really worth taking a look at um, because it's really, I really feel proud of the work that's happened. Um, 3D under this category, so our, um, fourth goal um, speaks to completing professional learning plans for all student high school students. Right now, um, we work on this through the 
student-led conference system, um, but what, what we learned is that students don't always necessarily know that those are their personal learning plans. And so just being really much more intentional and using the language that students hear um, out and about in the community or in the news in the state of Vermont as part of Act 77, um, and make sure that they know that they have those plans and they know what those plans are all about and they're really well informed um, in terms of advocating for their own learning and their own um, learning pathways. 3E speaks to um, articulating the completing detailed assessment frameworks and then making sure that each content area and grade level have common assessments so that they have common data banks to pull from to inform teaching practices. Um, and 3F speaks to um, exposing middle and high school students to a variety of career fields, career clusters, um, secondary planning, post-secondary planning, um, working with the career center, getting them out into the community to see what um, is available locally in terms of jobs and opportunities that need to be filled in our community. Um, so we're looking forward to that work. Um, and 3G speaks to our IEPs and special education services um, and really moving from a caseload service model, which is what we have now where students have a single case manager, um, to a model where we're looking at cohorts, so students who have similar needs um, and those being addressed across the elementary schools. Um, in addition to the creation of the therapeutic programs at the elementary schools to remediate re behaviors um, that can sometimes get in the way of students um, learning as completely as we'd like them to. Um, another thing that I think is really exciting that we discussed um, throughout this process is that when an outside placement is necessary for a student, um, that we create an exit timeline. So if we have those most serious interventions or the highest level of need for one-to-one -one paraprofessionals or outside of school placements that we look at how we peel those service back, services back and help our students to become more ind independent um, if they're working with a one-to-one -one paraprofessional or how we get them back into our school system if they have to be sent to an outside placement to um, meet some need that they have. Um, and then finally, taking an annual look at our school board ends and policies keeping community priorities in mind and um, making sure that the work we're doing really closely aligns with what's expected of us. Great, thank you, Lisa. You uh, finally, Kelsey Al Albandia, I think I have it right this time. I've butchered it a number of times. Kelsey is a math teacher in the middle school and she will take us through goal four. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so goal four is to expand students' personal development skills, and so this goal really focuses on the on the student and on the social emotional learning of the student. Um, like the other goals, this one came out of all you know the forums and the survey, but really this one also came out of um, looking at some of the things that we that we did in the schools during this COVID era and kind of what good came out of that. And so you'll see um when i read some of the objectives some of them are, are kind of fun what we did this year that actually worked pretty well and that we hope to continue um, in future years so one objective would be to increase mental health supports for students and families and so that would involve um, hiring more mental health staff at all the levels of the school so elementary middle and high school um, so they can reach more students and uh, reach into the homes as well hire an outreach coordinator who can also um, be an access for these families and then provide some year long after school tutoring and kind of that tier two level um, to help students, you know, beyond the school hours. Um, and we're hoping that with this, like, you know, we'll see better attendance rates, um, reduction in DCF referrals and that, those sort of things. Um, the second objective of this goal is to help students expand their development of critical thinking skills. And so we want to hear help um, students really separate fact from fiction to be good problem solvers and carry on those good conversations um, in this kind of really um, tough world sometimes. We, we think that we'll really see this too when we look at students um, 
presentations during senior projects is a good time to see where students have really come with that development of, of skills. Um, a third objective here is to increase student ownership in their own personal learning. And so um, with this, we want to think about things um, like executive functioning skills for students. And right now, um, the staff at the middle school and high school are taking part in executive functioning training. So we're trying to really uh, make sure that we can help students in that realm. Um, and then help students also in the kind of more of the habits in terms of the growth mindset and perseverance in, in all the schools and then working on that. Um, 4D of this, the next objective is to align social emotional learning standards for students across all grades. Um, so this involves um, some partnerships with our local mental health agencies like Clara Martin Center um, and just to have them, you know, be more part of our school and to do some, um, some uh, tiered support in our school. So thinking about like that PBIS um, systems. Um, again, make sure that all uh, teachers and staff have training in trauma and executive functioning. Um, another objective is to provide some age appropriate wellness breaks for all students pre-K 12. And so this is again where it really came out of looking at what we did this year with COVID that we gave um, all students uh, recess, which really was used to be an elementary thing to do. And we found that it was so beneficial for kids in the middle school and high school. And so we're hoping that we can keep that going in future years and give students an appropriate wellness break throughout the day. Um, and then the last objective of this goal is to um, ensure that all students acquire basic financial literacy and life skills before graduation. And this one really came out a lot in the forums from um, students and from community members. They want to see students graduate with some um, some more life skills and some financial literacy skills and so we hope to incorporate more of that into the curriculum great thank you very much and i i meant to well i'll introduce folks first but i i want to uh, make sure that the board understands that uh, the items in blue under action steps and here under um, uh, kind of the, the accountability. If it's in blue, it means it's something new. If it's in brown, it means it's been ongoing and maybe stepped up a little bit. Uh, the other piece that, uh, that we did in, in our last meeting is we, uh, we did the priority voting uh, to be able to, at the top of each one of these goals, uh, for example, in, uh, in four, 4A uh, was the highest priority in that goal uh, section and 4F was the lowest priority uh, and again that was based on the 15 or so members of the design team and the same follows through with all of the other ones uh, the other the other piece at the at the beginning the legend uh, talks about roles of board of superintendent and of other uh, other individuals and then again brown is existing initiatives blue are uh, new initiatives and yeah i think we're we're good on that so let me just introduce the other members of the team um, i don't know that uh, many of them are here but wilder grimes is a high school junior uh, helped us really kind of keep the connection with the student body kayla link is a randolph elementary teacher richard hayward uh, brookfield elementary teacher gus howe johnson i think is with us tonight uh, but Gus is a Randolph Elementary teacher. James Wesselkooch, uh, a music teacher in all the elementary schools. DC Mendez is a high school parent. Heidi Arias is a nonprofit organization elementary parent. You might know her as the director of the recreation department. Jeff Higgins, a Brookfield Elementary parent and Vermont Tech professor. David White is a middle school parent and you all know Anne is your school board chair. Uh, I'm just gonna share with you one final piece and I had it up here. Let me make sure that I still have it. Uh, it's a, I call it a, a macro view of, of the goals. This isn't of Randolph and of OSSD. This happens to be in another school district that I'm doing uh, planning. They had five main uh, goal areas but what it is is it it gives you a snapshot i call it a macro timeline of what's happening in each of these goal strands so that someone on a website can click on this and be able to see that 
uh, here uh, when, we when are, are. Are you trying to share that with us right now? Because it's not, we're not. Oh, it's not that. coming out? No. Oh, okay. All uh, we're seeing is the OSED, OSED belief statement. All right. Well, I guess, I, I guess you'll just have to take my word for it. Uh, let me let me go back to where I was, and I'll uh, I'll finish here. Uh, does the board have any any feedback uh, based on what you see tonight that we should pay attention to uh, before I send send out the the final plan uh, for you to to adopt? Are there any any thoughts you had? Anything that happened tonight? Uh, in conversation that you'd like to address, uh, because we're always in the in a feedback mode. In fact, uh, strategic plans need to be flexible and nimble. And as you as you go through your your annual uh, assessment of how how things are how the objectives are being accomplished or not, uh, you sometimes have to have to make uh, some changes or have some wonderful celebrations. So any, any board feedback uh, before we say it's a, a completed process? Any thoughts that you have? I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, the first one, I want to thank the volunteers. I know, um, living through strategic planning processes, I certainly can recognize the time and energy that goes into this. So um, really thank you very much. And for those that are here with us tonight, um, I have two questions. And my first one, um, probably more towards the leadership that's here this evening, uh, but did this process reveal any surprising gaps um, in the current system? I'm, I'm assuming that's a Lane and David and Lisa question. Yeah, I was actually, you know, I can speak for myself and then the other folks can pipe in. Um, I think one of the things that was pleasing about the process was that the vast majority of what's on there are things that we've identified and a lot of them, you know, work has already begun uh, before the strategic planning process took place. Um, so I think um, it's uh, it's very kind of reassuring to see that other people are also seeing the same things that, that, that we've been concerned about the last couple of years. Yeah, I, I am not sure that um, there were any sort of puzzling gaps. Um, I was a little, um, I was a little, not dismayed, I don't know. Um, I, I think I had a perception that we were communicating um, better than it seems like the community feels like we communicate. And so I think that that is a good message for us to know that they really want more. Um, and so that was good for us to learn. Um, and they want more activities to be brought into the school and to see kids getting out into the community more. Um, so I think that was was good information for us. And there was one other point that I wanted to make and I'm not remembering what it was specifically. So David, if you have something you can jump in and if I remember, I'll, I'll raise my hand. You're on mute, David. No, I, I now you have to hear it twice. Um, um, I, I don't have anything to add, sorry. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to to um, share, and I had written a note earlier, was that um, the career and college exposure um, was something that came up over and over again. And I think, you know, I know that each grade level goes to a different college. So like seventh grade visits CCV, and then eighth grade typically will visit VTC and different years go different places. Um, and so more of the career education is what people seem to be looking for. So we definitely received that message through this process as well. So my follow-up question is, um, do, how do you feel about the buy-in from the staff to take this, um, really this roadmap that has now been developed and to start with the implementation 
um, with the staff that is here now? I feel pretty optimistic. So as Lane mentioned, a lot of this work has already begun. So um, we've been looking at using data um, to drive decision making for a few years now. Um, and we've got those processes in their beginning phases and people are really, I think, appreciating those processes and have bought into them. So I think that as we go through the process of creating professional development that builds on what they already are doing and already have learned since we, we started going more deeply in these specific areas, I think we'll get more and more buy-in. Yeah, and I think it's a I think it's a well well placed question. Um, and what's nice about it is that we're not, in terms of the strategic plan, there's nothing in there that's going to require like a 360 degree turn from what we're already doing. There are some things that are going to going to add a little bit more um, uh, to 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 the work that that we're engaged in. But there is nothing that we've been working on, you know. Um, very diligently that's going to have to come to a stop or who's that's going to have to change completely because of this and because of that i think there's going to be a tremendous amount of buy-in I, I also think that just through the process um staff had a lot of opportunity to contribute and and did i mean not just the people on the strategic planning group um which was a good representative group um you know at every turn People had a chance to contribute and and were listened to. And I'll just add, uh, folks didn't feel too bashful about saying what they uh, what they thought. Uh, so it's authentic feedback. Okay. Any any last thoughts before we wrap this up for this evening? No, just to, just to mimic the same, um, an incredible amount of work, um, detailed work, an incredible investment of time, um, and just a thank you. Um, it is incredible, incredibly helpful, incredibly valuable. Great. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm very honored to work with the, the school district where my wife spent 25 years, and I've kept her abreast of, of some of her former colleagues, I was gonna say old colleagues, but I didn't think that would be appropriate. So I'll say former colleagues, and uh, I wish you the very best. And I enjoyed so much working with you all and, and especially with the design team members. So thanks a lot and I'll sign off now and get this formally sent to you uh, as we wrap up a multi-month process. Take care and have a good rest of the board meeting. Thank you very much, Winton. Okay. Okay. So any any other comments after having gone through that process from board members? I'm going to kind of hog the um, airway here. So I, I think it's really important for all of us to think about one of the major findings that just came out of this report and that's communication. Um, we asked our community to, fee to share their feedback, to share their input. And I would just be interested to know now as how this information is gonna be shared back out with them, what that time frame is and the detail behind um, the, both the survey findings um, and the actual strategic plan itself. That's a great, a great question. And as we go into our, our into our training for um, July, one of the big things, one of the main goals of our of our um, board, or one of our main roles, is to be communicating with our community. So as we figure out what we want to put on our on our agenda, I'm I'm hoping that um, we'll we'll be working that into what we're doing. Do you have any? Do you have suggestions, or are you are you um, or do you have a vision right off the the top of your head that you're hoping for? 
Well, I just wasn't sure if there was the communication plan already built around this. Um, I guess I assumed that there probably was. So I was just anxious to hear what that timeline was. Uh, we, we haven't, we didn't come up with a timeline, but it's going to be sort of shared because there are certain parts of the strategic plan, as you saw, that are more sort of board oriented and then others that are more administration oriented. So I think as we look ahead, we can work with Lane to sort of figure out who wants to share what and who wants to take what on in terms of, of getting that word out to the public. Any any thoughts there, Lane? I think um, the strategic planning session for July that's coming up is a good place to start to have kind of an initial discussion. Um, and then following that up, um, you know, once the board actually physically adopts the strategic plan, um, then at that point in time, I've got a strategic planning meeting that is set up for the administrative cabinet in early August to take a look and start to break down the parts and pieces and start to get the plans in place for implementation. So I think those two uh, those two groups of meetings and getting all the minds together are going to complement one another um, as, as we put, put things in, into place and start thinking about the priorities and, and, and which parts and pieces to work on first and what's most important. I guess I have just a quick question to piggyback on that, but is this going to be a public document? It should be. They should know what we're working on. They can't hold us accountable if they don't. Yeah, that was my main thing, is if, if what we just saw um, would actually be a public document available on the OSSD website for community yeah. members to access. Yeah, uh, remember, you guys still have a, an, an extra step in the process mm -hmm. here is that you actually have to vote to approve and confirm. Right, and that last piece, I I believe Winton's going to put it together, but it, he wasn't able to show it when he was sharing his screen. Is just sort of a a graphic for it, and I believe that was one of the things that he wanted to do with the final plan. Um, I'm not sure whether or not he'll actually do that, or if he'll just have what what we saw in in the um, sort of in that table format versus the the fancy graphic. He, that's what he was attempting to show us. We saw it in the design team, but he, he didn't quite figure out the uh, screen share to be able to show that to us. So all that should, it, it will be posted on the, on the website. Okay, do we have any other comments or questions, concerns? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. We need to appoint our auditor. Um, and so we used uh, Father Gill, Siegel, and Valley, um, unless there's a, a, a reason that a board member feels we should change. Um, uh, we need to just go through the process of, of uh, appointing that auditor. And then, Lane, do we ask you to have Robin set that up, or is that something that I do as the board chair? Um, so once once the board has board voted that um, to stay with the same auditor, if that's the intent, um, then that's something that Robin can set up. Uh, my belief is that the board chair is probably going to have to sign um to make it official and so as part of a motion if you vote on this tonight would also be delegating the authority um to sign on behalf of the board for okay. that purpose yeah so we're folks do we have um anyone have concerns about the auditing company that we used no should i make a motion uh, I move that we remain with the same auditor for the OSSD. And you have to add that other little bit. Oh, what was the, the and? That, and that you authorize. And that I authorize the, the, board, board. the board chair to sign off on the contract. On behalf of the board. Yep. Behalf. Okay, authorize the board chair to sign 
on behalf of the board, the contract. Thank you for the coaching. <laughs> I second. Okay, all of those in favor? Aye. Okay, uh, so that has been passed. Um, and next, we're going to just hear a quick overview of the teachers agreement that uh, Wayne and the board members have, have concluded with the teachers. Yeah, and um, thank you to the, the team. We had Hannah and Brian and Megan on the team right up through um, mediation, um, which happened on June 2nd. Mediation was successful. Um, after I think it was about three hours um, of, of kind of going back and forth, we focused in solely on the salary pieces. Um, it didn't appear at all that, you know, we were going to reach any kind of common ground on, um, on language um, concerns that, that either of the sides had. But the tentative agreement that was reached calls for a two-year teacher's contract with a 3% new money increase in year one and a 4.15% increase in year two. New money means that um, their normal step increases that are a regular part of the contract are included as part of that percentage, right? So they get their step increase plus whatever uh, additional percent to get them to 3% in year one. In year two, they get their contractual step increase plus whatever percent on top of it to get them to the 4.15. Um, in checking with what was going on uh, in terms of settlements around the rest of the state at the time, um, if things had gone to fact finding and then to an arbitrator, um, they pretty much just look at what other districts are settling at. They don't care about, you know, where uh, a district is in terms of how well paid their, their staff are, or the benefits they have. They strictly look at what those settlements are. Most of those settlements were coming in around 9% or more for two years. Um, so, so we did very well in the negotiating process. And I give a lot of credit um, as well and a lot of thanks to the teachers. Um, they did vote to ratify um, this tentative agreement and it sounded like it was uh, pretty much unanimous after talking with Maura. Um, so I think they're happy. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, Lane, is our budget in a position where there will not have to be any cuts to be able to satisfy that salary negotiation? Yeah, and I give, uh, again, Megan and Hannah there that night a lot of credit. Um, we stuck to our guns on that first year. Right, because that's the budget that you guys voted on last um, January and the community voted on last March. And they kept it right at where uh, we set it, which was the 3%, which was the typical state average. Um, year two of the budget, that 4.15%, that budget is yet to be decided. Um, so that's the one we'll be working on um, starting in October. Um, so we should be in, in pretty good stead. So they, they did a really good job. Any other questions or comments? Was that your first time through, Megan? Yes, yeah. that was my first time and it was, in, what a process. <laughs> she, she's still catatonic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alive. <laughs> well, thank you for, for, the, for the effort. So then, uh, Lane, I, I know we talked about this, but I'm trying to remember what relegation of hiring authority. So uh, we do have to vote um, on the teacher's budget if you want to move it to the consent agenda, that's, that's good. The uh, relegation, sorry about, of, of hiring authority. We're entering a span of time for the next two months where the board doesn't have another official meeting until August. Um, we're at the end of kind of the hiring season and it's kind of frenetic right now because of all the extra money that came in from ESSER. And so it's a competitive advantage if when the staff uh, works in interviews and, and finds the teacher that they want after they've gone through the background checks and everything like that, if I can just sign them to a contract right then and there. 
Um, typically, your process, um, the hiring of teachers is a pro forma process anyway. It's right. It's just it's a procedure that you guys follow. There's not really any questions or whatnot about it. So my recommendation is just to help out um, this process a little bit is that the board make a motion to delegate the authority to hire just teachers um, to the superintendent uh, basically from now until the board's August meeting. Um, and that way, again, if they're you know looking at two or three possible positions, um, it's a lot easier if I can sign them to the contract right then and there when they're with me, um, as opposed to saying, well, nothing's really official until you know August you know 14th or 15th through the next time the board meets, because that that leaves a lot of um, a lot of discomfort when things aren't official for a couple of months. And those are usually things that are in our consent agenda anyway. Yep. We're just voting it voting it through because we have to. Yeah, that's the pro forma piece. Yep. So do you need from us uh, a motion saying that we give you the authority to uh, sign on teachers? And then will we still do sort of a consent in August or? You'll, you'll still get the, the presentation in August, uh, the form that Linda creates that shows who the positions are. Um, and, and where they're at. Um, I don't expect that there'll be a lot of them. Um, the biggest question right now is um, hiring for the ESSER funding. Um, the guidance on how that money can be used has been changing since its inception. So I'm a little hesitant to be doing much hiring from it until that guidance is a lot clearer. So there probably will be some some hiring, you know, mid mid July-ish, end of July-ish um, based on that money. Are there any questions from board members about what this means? This is really an authority that we've we've delegated over to Lane and we we approve his hires, but it's just sort of a formality. It's not we're not judging them at that point. So what we're going to be doing is so we need to make a motion that says we give you the authority to to hire hire teachers um, through uh, the first board meeting or through the board, August board meeting would be ideal. Okay. If you so if you're so inclined. Are we so inclined, board? I make a motion that we relegate the authority to Lane to hire or sign the contracts. For any uh, professionals that are hired before our August board meeting. No second. All those in favor? Okay, it passes. Uh, next up is the executive limitations report, monitoring report. So this is. Um, Lane, do you want to speak a little bit about this report? Yeah, this is um, the second read uh, for the report. So this is Executive Limitation 2.7. Um, it's related to compensation and benefits of non-unionized employees. Um, so, so folks that aren't in one of our, our, our four different um, union units. Um, it really kind of relates to the compensation and benefits um, provided to them. Um, as well as outside contractors, it's really meant to ensure that uh, what we provide is reasonable and comparable to our local markets and that we're not entering into agreements that are in excess of our revenues. Um, it's also making sure that we're not, there's not favoritism. Um, you know, we're not hiring a person on uh, in terms of a permanent, you know, forever contract. You know that we're we're limiting the the district's liability um, out to the limits of what we can foresee in terms of uh, the budget prospects for the next few years. And in this one, I I do report compliance um, across all the different uh, provisions of that that executive limitations. Do we have any questions on the EL report? Okay, so we're gonna we need to move to accept the EL report 2.7. 
So moved. Do we have a second? I'll second. Seconded by Megan. All those in favor? Okay, that's accepted. Um, next up, we have the um, monitor. Anne, can oh. I just interrupt? I apologize. But um, we neglected to accept the teacher's agreement um, back before we did the relegation of hiring authority. So I think we oh. need to go back and make sure that's noted. So okay. I will make the motion to accept the teacher's agreement as presented for the 2021 to 2023 two-year contract time frame. Do we have a second? Uh, I can second that as well. Okay. All those in favor of approving the teacher's agreement for the 2021-23 teacher's contract? And it's accepted. Okay, so now we're moving on to, thank you, by the way, Ashley, um, the quarterly facilities monitoring report. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about this for a few minutes, and I apologize. This one came out a bit late. The um, facilities team was scrambling around. Um, it's summer construction season, right? It's Vermont. It's a short season. So there were a lot of things that, that came up, um, work that needs to be done to get ready for the fall. Um, and a lot of that work is in there. So basically what you're going to see are a lot of kind of new initiatives in there, um, a lot pertain to the, the technical center, and it's really about doing the renovations that are needed to support the dental assisting program, um, the changeover of the graphics arts to the digital media program, um, an expansion of the electrical core program, and um, some much needed work in an, in an old space in the construction trades program. So there's a huge chunk of new uh, pieces in the facilities report, new initiatives that they're working on to get that work done. Um, in terms of the Raven building, um, they've been in that building for a year, year and a half now. Um, they've had some time to live in the building and uh, see how that facility space is working for them. Um, and there are a couple of things that they, they've decided that it would be good to have. And so those are on there. Um, the new facilities report is priorities to try to get done this summer. Um, one of the big discussions uh, that was had in Bob and Wes and myself, and just talked about the school lunch facilities across the district. Um, much of the equipment that supports that program in each of the schools is coming to the end of its useful life. And so there's a lot of work going on right now to try to re replace um, damaged and worn equipment um, and to try to get that in place, hopefully uh, by next fall. There is one piece that's a little bit problematic, um, and that is the foundation, the actual building foundation underneath um, RES. Um, for whatever reason, when they built that concrete slab in there, they didn't use the right materials. It looks like it may have been done for cost saving purposes. Um, so it's quite possible that to get that up to code and up to spec where it needs to be, um, we may have to do some pretty serious work. We may have to remove that foundation from under that area and replace it. And so um, we're doing and having some discussions um, with the state folks that come in and do the inspections um, to see how extensive that that needs to be. Um, so there's a lot of focus right now um, in terms of school lunch facilities. And again, just because a lot of the equipment that supports that program across the district is, is 20 years old or older. So end of, end of useful life. Um, lastly, um, there is a little bit of work that you'll see on there um, that's really related to this middle school concept. Um, kind of creating a middle school within the high school. Um, and the folks, the team over at RUHS, the task force that's been working over there, is really working on trying to make like a middle school wing, um, getting all the middle school classes and programs together in the same place with their own dedicated bathrooms um, to give them um, 
kind of their own culture, a little bit separate um, from the rest of the high school. Um, helps build trust uh, with the adults um, that'll be a part of that program, um, gives the kids a little bit of space um, as they go through all the major transitions um, that students of that age um, are going through. And so there's a little bit of work that's been added um, to, to help with that. Um, but that, that's primarily the, the biggest piece that you're going to see on the, the, the quarterly facilities monitoring reports are all these new additions that are related to those four areas. I don't know if there's any questions um, in terms of that work at this point in time or other things that, that may be on there. Is this above and beyond what we have been spending in, in maintaining our facilities? Yeah, so some of these, um, we are trying to take advantage a little bit of this year end surplus to do some of this work. Um, some of it, depending upon the size and the scope, may not be able to get done in the regular facilities budget and might require us coming back to the board to tap into the reserve funds. Now, those reserve funds um, have been a concern to me for a little while. Not that we have them, that's a really good thing. But we've got some significant amounts in, in, in two or three of those reserve funds, um, and that money should really be going towards supporting uh, the work that we're doing with kids, supporting our programming, and supporting the facilities needs that we currently have. Um, that facilities reserve fund was created originally, my understanding um, was to make sure that we had money available to replace the roofs on the building when their 20-year lifespans were up. Um, and the biggest concern, nobody wanted to really touch those reserve funds because we didn't know how much the cost was going to be of the most expensive one, which was RES. Um, the cost of that was actually under a million dollars. You know, we were figuring it was going to come in around 1.5. Um, and so we are currently sitting on over 3 million in reserve funds um, in that account. It would be nice to put that money to work um, within the schools for the schools. Um, and maybe get that down to about a million. Um, and part of the work that we're going to be doing uh, with the strategic planning with the cabinet in August um, is just that, is, is the creation of a really strong five-year um, facilities renovation plan that ties into the other components of the strategic plan that you guys have worked so diligently to create to make sure that everything is tying together and supporting itself the way that it should. Um, Plus, I think um, part of the legislative uh, agenda, you know, one of the laws that they're passing is going to require such a plan anyway, um, as well, um, as the state is kind of reassessing things coming out of COVID and, and getting, you know, a, a pretty clear understanding that, hey, maybe it wasn't a good idea to have a moratorium on matching funds for doing school renovations and, and, and rebuilding schools because now we're in this state of inequality again. Um, so they're going to be doing a, a pretty significant study, it looks like, over the next year or so um, to get a feel for the state schools as a whole and then hopefully start earmarking some monies towards that work. So this is kind of an opportune time to do this because if that law gets passed, um, I think it's next, next December that they have to have that report out. Um, we might be able to take advantage not only of, of our reserve funds to do some incredible work around here, but also matching funds from the state at the same time. Um, so it's kind of fortuitous. But yeah, um, some of it will definitely be, be above and beyond what's in the regular facilities, but it is needed. Um, one of the other things that you know we'll talk about when we hit the financials is that when the district brought in uh, the one-to-one -one program where every student gets their own computer, every teacher has their own computer to work from or work through. There was never really anything built into the budget um, to make sure that those computers were getting replaced every year. Um, and talking with Robin, as we're kind of looking at things, um, it sounds like the plan was just to use year-end surplus when the, you know, every four years when those things came due. I'm not comfortable with that. Um, so what I'm going to be doing in, in next year's budget, uh, we'll be talking about the fact that, hey, you know, if we want to always make sure that no kid has a computer that's older than three years, then we should be replacing a third of those computers every year and it should be in the regular budget um, period the end. Um, and so you'll see some changes. We'll talk a little bit about that when the budget happens in the fall. Um, but yeah. So good stuff. A lot of good stuff. A um, lot, lot of good works that uh, 
the facilities is 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 engaging in right now that's really going to have a, a strong impact on our programs and hopefully culture and climate right mm -hmm. anyone else have any questions about the facilities report Sorry, I have, I have, I have uh, teenagers with deep voices in the room. <laughs> uh, so no other, no other questions about the facilities report. Okay, uh, we'll move on to um, legislative update, Lane. So I put a pretty extensive um, update in the superintendent's report. Um, just because there was so much, um, I'm happy uh, to answer any questions that folks may have. Um, know that at the time of the writing that most of those uh, bills um, had actually gone over to the governor's desk and were awaiting um, either him signing them, rejecting them, or allowing them to pass into law without his signature but I'm not sure if there's specific questions on any of the parts and pieces that were, were, were in that legislative update. And I can talk at least on the, the one that's the nearest and dearest to my heart because it, it kicks off the budget season um, that'll, that'll be starting up in October, um, was they did increase uh, the property yields um, fairly significantly. Um, there's a lot of ways to think of, of property yield, the way they don't want you to think about it, even though it's really what it does. It's the amount of money we get per student from the Ed Fund. Um, last year, it was 10,988. Next year, it's 11,317, so it's gone up, um, which is good. So that means that they've got a fair amount of confidence in um, you know, the, the money flowing into the coffers for the Ed Fund. But at the same time, they're also aware that there was a huge shift uh, in terms of, of parents and students accessing homeschooling during COVID to avoid um, coming into public spaces. And because it's still unsure how much of that is gonna carry over into next year or whether or not there'll be a rebound, um, the house did a, a pretty good job of making sure that our equalized pupil counts, um, uh, they're not gonna dock any district whose enrollments go down significantly. Um, they're gonna make sure that those equalized pupil uh, amounts um, stay at at least 96 and a half percent of uh, you know previous years um, so that's good so they are really doing what they can to stabilize um, the school so I give them a lot of credit for that um, we talked a little bit about the needs and conditions of school facilities that's one of the um, the projects one of the task force that they put together to really kind of go out and take a look at um, what are the safety needs what are the HVAC needs um, what are the immediate health um, needs for schools um, to get them up to code, get them up to spec, so that if something like this should happen again, we are prepared. Um, and so that research will be happening this year. And the hope is, is that they're putting together a couple of other councils, like a school building authority council, that's gonna take that information and then respond to the legislature in terms of how much um, it may need to put aside um, as a budgetary item to be able to support this work over time to get it done. Um, we don't know um, what the outcome, um, it, it'll be a while, of the next round of um, negotiations with the state at the state level for healthcare for teachers, because that happens at the state level. Um, I can't imagine that the impact is gonna be any greater than it was the last round. I think we are all kind of up to the same spec across the state right now. So I don't think it'll be a dramatic uh, change. The biggest change we'll get is just the, the yearly annual 14% increase that we see in healthcare premiums. Um, but that'll, that'll be the biggest impact. Um, the last piece is probably worthy of note is that um, they, made a recognition as a state kind of the same recognition that we made looking at our own data from track my progress over the last year that there's a real need for some literacy um, training and support for students um, to make sure that they're learning to read and write well 
Um, and so they're putting together a council um, that's going to advise the state board on um, creating training programs and technical support to districts um, that are doing this work. Um, so it actually, it's very good. A lot of these things that are happening at the state level are kind of dovetailing in with the needs that we've identified um, within the district ourselves. So I think there's a lot of good work that's going to be able to get done over the next couple of years. So I think those are the, those are the biggies. Um, and most of those do you think will pass or will get, have enough I, support? Yeah. I, I think there's a, there's a pretty good shot. They, there wasn't much discussion, at least in the superintendent's group um, and uh, and the VSBA group um, that I was sitting in on that there was an expectation to veto. Um, what it sounds like, if there are one or two of those bills uh, that the governor may not be as happy with, is he'll just let the time limit run out on them, not sign them, so that they automatically pass into law. Um, so I think it's there. There's a good chance that at least at the time that we had these discussions about a week ago, um, that most of these will pass. And the other other big one, obviously, is the waiting um, study um, that impacts you know funding for for schools and, and and for special education. And so they are moving forward cautiously um, on that. Um, again, kind of a, another another study. Um, to kind of take a look and present to the General Assembly some an action plan to start to implement, you know, the results of their waiting study that, that was um, done about a year ago. Um, so they're really working on the implementation plan right now. Okay. Any any questions for Lane? That waiting study would would work in our favor also right my assumption is um because a, a big proportion of it is um you know students of poverty you know we, we generally we we hover around the 40 percent um district wide um you know Brook, brookfield typically typically is much lower than that um but district wide we hover anywhere from 36 to 41 percent in the years that i've been here um, and obviously, the way the waiting study takes a look at things is um, districts that have a higher percentage of, of low income students um, get a bonus in terms of the waiting um, for the funding that comes to the schools. So that is, that is the assumption. Okay, so we're moving on to the consent agenda and um one of the things in the consent agenda is um approving arbitrage which lane if i'm remembering correctly that's when basically the district borrows money um ahead of time because we have to pay bills but we haven't quite we haven't gotten the the money from the state yet for yeah the budget is that correct? yeah they, they lag we, we start the new year july 1st um they lag behind usually i think it's around september ish that we we get the first tax payment so it's just to carry things over until then okay so what we're what we do there is we're approving uh that they can go out and and borrow money right to borrow money to yeah. cover things until they get that tax revenue in and Linda can remind me, I think if you, as part of this one, it's also a motion for you to be able to right. sign. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Um, unless we all want to go, or a majority of us want to go in and sign that, that agreement, we can all choose to do that, or we can, in improving it, we can, you can give authority to me to go in and sign for the board to allow them to borrow money to cover bills until we get revenue in. So we need to have a, a, a motion on that, on that particular consent agenda item. Everything else we can just um, approve as a, as a slate of. I just had a quick question on the professional contracts. Um, when it says replacement, that means that that was a position that hire was replacing a previous um, pr professional teacher, and then new is a new position that was created. Yes, yep. that's correct. Yep. Okay.
Okay, so, so um, I'm sorry. I yeah. actually, so I'll make the motion about arbi the arbitrage, but then I also have a question on the professional contracts. Is that okay? Sure. So I make a motion that we grant the authority to um, Chair and Kathleen to sign on the arbitrage um, paperwork allowing for borrowing your money on behalf of the board. No second. All those in favor? Sorry, I missed a second. Who was the second? Sorry, Linda, Katja. Katja. Okay, and then Ashley, you had a question yeah. on the professional contract? So I have a question on the um, senior project coordinator. I believe the last two years, wasn't that one a full-time position? With, I believe first it was Lisa Floyd and then it went to Pev Kelman. Was that the case or were they split also in the classroom doing something else? They had, Linda, Linda may have more details than I do, but they had a, a year that it was a full-time position and then they transitioned it back to kind of a part-time, part-time. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Lisa Floyd's still on. She probably could explain better, but I believe it was a split position. Um, I, I am still here, Linda. I'm making dinner, though, so I muted my camera. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to answer the question. Um, so it was a full-time position um, previous, so uh, over a year ago. Um, so what we did was separate the position. So um, Jamie Connor will um, continue to teach AP Lit and a AP Language. Um, and will oversee some of the PBLs. She's done a fantastic job um, with PBL in the past, so that'll be 0.5. But then the senior project coordinator will also be a 0.5 senior project coordinator and 0.5 English teacher. And the reason for that is that what I found in the last year that I filled the role was that it was really helpful for me to um, support students as they wrote their senior project papers through the senior English class. So by being an English teacher um, and also seeing the project, but not the person who assesses the papers, it allowed me to give students support um, in ways that felt really necessary. So decoupling those two positions and then having those people be versatile enough to continue to support our English program felt like a really good combination um, to meet our academic goals with our students. Thank you. Any other questions on the consent agenda item? Can we have a motion to pass the consent agenda? This is Katja, so moved. We have a second. I'll second. <clears throat> Seconded by Rachel. Uh, all those in favor of passing the consent agenda? Aye. Okay, moving on to our reports. Um, those were all enclosed. Um, Lane, you already spoke a little bit about your superintendent's report. Is there anything else you wanna fill us in on? Uh, there, there's other For some reason, your, your uh, mic I think you're there. muted, Lane. Oops, sorry about that. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that are in the report. Um, there are a couple other incidentals that we should probably talk about that are kind of above and beyond as well. Okay. I think that, you know, actually take a moment to talk about um, the elementary kind of the preliminary scoring that's coming out was kind of expected um, that the elementaries would be lower. Um, you know, we actually had an increase at the, the, the high school level, which was really, really good. And then we've got the elementary um, students that have been scoring about 5% higher per year for the last three to four years now. 
and then a, a dip this year because of COVID. Um, we kind of knew that it was coming a little bit because when we did the track my progress review in front of the board, I think it was probably February-ish, you know, things were down around 10%. Um, and again, a lot of it has to do with, with the students um, themselves and that, uh, you know, being in school is a much better environment than, than being out of school at this age, especially with the concrete nature of their thought processes, especially as it relates to mathematics. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is um, because also um, included in the board more just by way of information, the board packet was um, the recovery plan um, that's related to the federal funding through uh, the Coronavirus Relief Act. And with this data coming out now, it's actually pretty fortuitous because on Wednesday, I'm pulling the cabinet back together um, to take a look at those scores um, as much as we can look at them before the embargo is lifted and decide if we need to rearrange and, and, and adjust that recovery plan. The recovery funds are specifically designed for the purpose of remediating any losses that occurred over the course of this past year due to COVID. And in my mind, if we've been increasing like crazy the last couple of years and we have a fall off this year, there are some things that we need to remediate. We need to get these students back up um, to where they should be. And one of the best ways uh, probably to do that, um, again, it's just one idea that's out there, is that maybe a couple of times a week, we've got extended time on learning. You know, the kids are spending an extra half hour on, on mathematics. Um, two or three times a week and, and maybe an extra, extra, you know, half hour to hour, you know, once a week on ELA because it's the only way to catch up um, when you're behind. Um, the testing problems aren't due to, you know, disabilities or things like that. It's just uh, the concepts that the kid and kids were unable to pick up on well um, in the hybrid environment that we were under. And so that's a big discussion that's going to be happening uh, on Wednesday with the cabinet. So that one's worth worth talking about. But. I'm curious, Lane, are, are superintendents or principals sharing across districts too? Just uh, is everyone sort of seeing similar? They can't until the 14th. Um, the discussions that we've had um, is I think I think we're going to be unusual. Um, I think that you're going to see decreases at the elementary level across the nation. I know nationwide it's happened. Um, I think we're going to be unusual in that we actually had an increase um, at the high school. That's not going to be the case in most places. Um, in most places, that'll probably be a decline. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see what what we can tell from what happens at the other schools. It's going to be a little bit difficult to compare the data. Um, because there was no real strict requirement on the percentage of kids that had to test. So in our case, we had 96% of our kids reporting in. Um, so we tested every kid. Um, in some cases, the districts might only be testing 40 or 50%. So it's kind of hard to, to compare that data across districts sometimes, um, un unless they, you know, we're getting all their kids through, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that that should be quote that should be stated. Um, when the districts do their reporting out, it, one of the, the key factors that the federal government looks for is what percentage of kids. Typically, in a normal year, if you fall be below 95%, you get dinged pretty hard um, for that because it becomes an equity issue. You're not reporting all your students. Uh, Rachel? Yeah, isn't that, I was just going to say, isn't that the point of the data is that it's comparable every kid. Around, the, around the nation? That um, no. No. Um, that you can compare a kid in Vermont to a kid in the the point or trends the point, in Vermont to trends in yeah Texas. the 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 point of of standards based curriculum right of of switching over to a, a like the Common Core was that in the case of the Common Core if every state is teaching the same foundational standards in its core courses then a kid who leaves here um, you know, halfway through the year taking biology can start up halfway through the year in biology in Arkansas and should be at the same place and should know about the same um, as a student there. Um, the testing was a little bit different in that each state kind of has adopted or created its own testing to meet this federal requirement. So some states have easy tests, some states have hard tests, some states have moderate tests. So 
you can probably compare within a state fairly well. It gets a little bit more difficult to compare across states. Um, you know, there are some states that are standouts in Massachusetts with the MCAS. Um, that is a very highly rigorous exam. And so they usually get harm, high marks when their students are performing well, because compared to some of the other state tests that are out there, that, that's a high mark to reach for. Um, ours is actually not bad. Ours is probably in the upper tier of, uh, of, of uh, rigor um, in terms of the testing that's out there. So comparing within state, if the majority of a district, um, you know, students actually took this test, you might get some valuable information from that. Comparing across states, you might be able to get some information from it, but the validity of it would be questionable. Um, hopefully I'm making a little bit of sense. I have I have a question about that. Yeah. Is there any um, testing when kids switch schools, like through school choice or through moving or whatever that tests um, if they're up to speed at the new school or um, I don't in, know if there's any way to track that. I just. Yeah, we have a lot of kids that come in um, from other schools and, and that's, you know, kind of one of the quirky things. And it, it's one of the things that happens with students that are English language learners um, when they move into a school. Um, so if I have an English language learner who has never spoken um, a word of, of English in their lives and they move into my my school the week before SBAC testing, they still have to take SBAC, right? Um, in terms of the, the testing that you're talking about, um, some schools might do that um, and typically it's placement testing, um, kind of like some of the colleges do when you're coming in, okay, what math, what math course should you be starting at um, based upon your skill set? And we were running at the high school, I don't know if we still do, um, to try to make some determinations about which students you know, should be in kind of an accelerated math course as opposed to the regular. Um, but I, I have not seen that widespread. Um, again, I think, I think it would be more, more happenstance just trying to make sure the kid gets the best placement possible um, given the skill set that they're coming in with. So did I go around the question or did I help answer it? <laughs> no, I think, it, I think there's probably not a concrete way to sort of measure like my child that went to Randolph and then switched schools came in at a lower level than some other kids that had been in that school district the whole entire time. And so I'm, I'm just wondering like is algebra one, algebra one across the board, it may look like it is on paper but i'm not quite sure it actually measures up like that and yeah and if it, there's any way to measure that and if there's data out there that portrays that, and that's what our sbac scores do um our sbac scores are tied to that right. common core okay. right the yep. 43 states that got together to say hey based upon the best research and reaching out, they did 10 years of work, worth of research and they included all sorts of businesses in there too about what was important. This is what the best curriculum for this day and age would look like if you're in algebra two, if you're a math student. And so that's what the SBAC plays to. I think Lisa had her hand up. Um, I oh, Lisa does, yeah. Yeah. Of course, she's probably still preparing dinner. Yeah, no, I'm right here. Um, I just raised my hand because one of the things that we've been doing since we started using STAR 360 this year um, is that we've been giving that test three times a year. So we've had students who came in at the halfway point or even um, we had new students arriving in April. And so that data was, was really helpful because it helped us understand how we could support them where they might um, be struggling or if they needed acceleration really quickly after they got there. So we still plan to continue to use that test um, next school year as well. And it's just really effective in terms of screening students to see what their needs might be. Um, I don't think that really cleanly answers your question about your student going to another school and their performance. Um, but it is a step that we're taking to use data to help us serve students better. And I, I'm going to commend you for that because uh, that is an important piece of it. And when we brought in those testing programs, we were primarily, at least we're primarily looking at 
you know, making sure we understood where our students were performing and what we needed to do to get them up to speed to remediate um, in areas of weakness. So I, I commend you for, for taking that extra step and seeing that other piece it could be used for. <clears throat> So just to be clear, I think you said this, the SBAC that's given in Vermont is not the same as the SBAC given, given in Connecticut. It's not the same test. No, there, there are a couple of New England states that do the SBAC, um, right? You had, an, you had a consortium prior to SBAC. Um, there were like four New England states that all went in and created the same test together and gave it together. Um, but SBAC is a little bit different. There are a couple of other states you might be able to compare to that may use it as well. Um, you know, we can research that. But when this whole No Child Left Behind thing started back in 93, based upon a, uh, a report from 1980, um, every state kind of created its own thing at that point in time, because there wasn't a common core. Every state had its own standards and its own um, beliefs and what was important for students to learn. So they wanted to tailor the testing to show that um, the students in their state you know, how well they were performing against what the state said was important or what the state agreed itself was important for students to learn and know. Um, so there's been some 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 evolution of that. Common Core came later, probably about a decade after the, the, the whole push started in 93. So I guess probably the PSAT and then the SAT would be the universal measure of that in the older grades, like not in the younger grades, but. Yeah, you're better off, um, ACT is a better better test for that. Um, ACT was always a, a standards-based test. It was actually looking what students learned in their science classes and in their math classes. Um, the SAT is that now, um, they're a, they're a, a content-based exam now, but they weren't always. Right up until probably five years ago or so, they were an IQ test. They were a, a reasoning test. Um, and so they couldn't tell you much about what the kids had actually learned specifically in their courses, just how well they could use information to come to conclusions. Um, so the ACT is probably the, the best exam. Um, uh, out there if you want to try to compare across schools. Problem with the ACT is that not a large uh, portion of a student body typically takes it. Um, SATs typically are the, the test of choice on the coasts and the ACTs are typically the, the test of choice um, in the, the middle of the United States, even though that's changing. Um, so we don't, you know, if we got our, most of our kids are staying, staying locally or in the New England states, then most of them are, are probably taking the SATs. <clears throat> so good questions good making me think of a lot of stuff i haven't thought about in a while which is good since back when i was a principal okay so i have just one more question yep. <laughs> at the high school level is there um any sort of act or sat preparation or do kids just kind of take their classes and then also take the sat or is there an offering for any kind of sat act preparation that's a, I'll let Lisa, Lisa pipe in if she heard the question. Um, go ahead. Yeah. And then, I'll, um, and then I'll make an argument afterwards. I think that last year there were some offerings um, during callback for students who might've been at a level where they were interested in that. Um, but we've just really started thinking about how to more formally offer support around um, those things. I think though that one of the reasons why we picked STAR 360 was because it um, is a program or a test that scaffolds up. Um, typically people see the students who perform well on STAR perform well on um, SBAC and students who perform well on SBAC over time, it sort of can predict that they would also perform well on other tests. Um, so that is something we're thinking about, but but we don't have a formal system right now. And the argument that I'm going to present goes back to the SAT as a reasoning exam. Right now, it's switched over to a content test. It's testing what students have learned. So if we've done our curriculum well, we're assessing how students are performing and we're going back and adjusting when we find weaknesses, they should perform exceedingly well just by taking the courses that we offer um, through the high school. 
The prep was really important, especially for the SATs because it was a, a reasoning test. So um, somebody with really high level reasoning skills can sit down and look at a complex problem and come up with a strategy to solve it pretty quickly. SAT was a time test. And so what the test preps would do is they'd say, okay, here are a series of five or six types of complex problems that you will see repeatedly on the SATs. And here, ahead of time, is the best strategy to use. They trained them the strategy so they didn't have to think it up on the fly to use when you encounter you know, one of these questions. And so it was really, that's what the, the test prep was about in those days. Um, you can still do pre test prep and content, but technically if the students have, um, you know, have really mastered the standards in their courses um, that are based on the, the, the common core, they should do phenomenally well um, on the new SAT and on the ACT. So how do the Randolph kids do on the SAT and the ACT? Do we have any statistics about that? Uh, yeah, I'd have to pull them up. Um, they perform about the state average, um, if I remember. Um, I've got longitudinal data that I present usually every year um, with the board. Um, we had a, had a year or two that the mass scores were declining a little bit. Um, but again, that's something that we knew from our other testing as well, which is why a lot of the restructuring that happened in the last year or so was so vitally important. Um, and again, this year you're seeing your first, you know, your first jump in those scores because of that restructuring. Um, so that's a good thing. But typically they were uh, asked back for, for years and years and years in um, SATs. Typically they were SATs, they were at or just below the state average. Um, SBAC was typically very, very, very low for years and years. And that'll be a big report. You'll get to see that. Um, I present all that data usually in October and I'll give it to you longitudinally. You know, what's it look like over the last five years? Has it changed? Yeah. Okay. So good stuff. And you're interested, which is awesome. And that's a big part of what we're looking at as a board is what are we, what can we look out for, for out, outcomes and, and those tests will be our part of it. So, okay. So, um, and, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just have a question that's for Lane or Lisa as well. Um, when do the guidance counselors start working with um, the students to determine interests like their college plans? to ensure that their schedules are matching up with what the college's expectations would be? I'll let Lisa talk that, but typically it, it, it starts off at least freshman year, if not earlier. Um, but. Yeah, so um, Kara Merrill and Bev Taft have wrapped up um, talking with students. They met with them over the past few weeks, either in their classes or remotely um, to get them registered for classes for the next year. Um, so that should have happened within the last couple of weeks for all students. I know last Thursday, um, Kara was talking with seventh graders about their electives for next year. Um, and they were the last group that she needed to connect with. So. It was a little bit late this year, just because we had so many schedule shifts related to um, changing modalities and COVID and all of those sorts of crazy things. Um, but that should have happened for students um, pretty much across the board at this point in time. So if you're hearing something different, um, you should let us know. And Ash, Ashley, correct me, I think your question was a little bit deeper. Um, it sounded, and this is something that, that we may, may discuss, I think we, I discussed it a few years back, um, but something that we can revisit is, um, and something they may already be doing, is typically high schools will have a four-year planner um, for the students. Um, you know, the SAT has a really good program for students to go in and take a look at what their aptitudes are, and based upon those aptitudes, you know, what good possible career pathways are and, and, and things like that. I'm sure the guidance counselors are doing that work. But what the four-year planner does is um, once a student is starting to, you know, seriously consider a, a, a career pathway or, or a couple of career pathways, that's the time um, each year when guidance would sit down with them and say, okay, 
you know, we've got all this this data out there, all this research that says somebody who's interested in your career pathway, you know, these are the courses they need to take in high school, and these are the grades you need to get, and these are the scores on SATs that you want to get, um, you know, if you're going off to college um, to be successful in this pathway, and they're building that um, each year, right, making sure they're taking the right matrix of classes to get them to where they want to go. Um, it typically gets a little bit more complex in that as students get a little bit older and they start to narrow in if they're going to college, if they start to narrow in on a, um, a particular discipline that they want to study, then it's time to kind of sit down and have this discussion about, okay, what are some good colleges out there um, that you can afford that are uh, ideal for the discipline that you're pursuing? And now let's do a little bit of research and again, let's see what matrix of courses students that get accepted into those programs take. What are their scores? What are their 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 grades or how are they performing on your on your standards based report cards so that the students have uh, goals that they are shooting for uh, and, and checking in with their their mentors on to make sure that they're hitting those goals. Um, so that they've got a really good shot at getting into their the, the schools that they want that are really going to support them and the programs they are interested in. Um, and yeah. so I'm, yeah. Typically, um, four-year plans happen at the end of eighth grade. Um, and so the students will do the four-year plan and then um, meet with their school counselor to make sure that they're tracking in the right direction at the end of each school year. Um, so that is typically something that students should expect to see. Um, and in eighth grade, they also do sort of a career exploration essay and research project as part of that. Um, and that usually feeds into Kara's work as our middle school counselor, helping them think about what the courses are that they could potentially take in high school. Well, I guess that um, just for me, I, I guess, it goes back to the very beginning discussion we had this evening is about communication and you know the parents understanding that that's the process that's followed and having access to that four-year planner um, you know to make sure that their kids are indeed signing up for the classes they need um, so thank you for that update yeah and those might be good nights um because we, we have the title funding that we're using um, under the Title IV, you know, the money is to, to be used uh, to engage the parents in ways that they can support the district and its mission with their children. And that would be a wonderful use is to have the parents come in with the kids through that planning process. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of good ideas there. I, I appreciate the conversation on that. I'm not sure that parents know what that process is. So I do think that communication piece is super, super yep. lacking and important to address in the coming future. And I would just in closing, and I'll stop after this, um, I would just encourage the school to consider supporting you know the kids that are on a college track um, with some sort of like PSAT support you know after school sort of idea before school um, you know outside of just a few minutes during the day um, I think it's a great way to invest in our kids and help them prepare for that next step Okay, so moving on, um, financial report, did you, Lane, did you have anything that you needed to point out in terms of the financials? Are we looking good? Yeah, actually, we're looking very good. Uh, a lot of it due to COVID, there were things that we budgeted for, we figured we were going to be able to do that we couldn't. Um, so there will be a, a fairly significant surplus um, at the end of this year. Again, um, when the time comes to vote in March, um, probably take a good chunk of it and roll that back into the helping the taxpayers out in the coming years. Um, and then um, 
you know, deciding at that point in time that there are other facilities needs and things that we should be pursuing. Um, the only one that's a little bit quirky right now, which always is at this time of the year, is the food service. Um, it looks like they're down 117,000. They're not. Um, they just got uh, the the first of their reimbursement checks at the end of the year for 61,000. Um, they will be down. They always are. Um, we we always subsidize them. Um, they'll probably be down around 35,000, which is the norm um, by the looks of things right now. Um, so the, just part of part of running a program. It's hard hard for a program like that to break even. Yeah. But other than that, actually, things look look really, really good. Great. Any questions for Lane on financial? Okay. Board selfie Val. Chelsea. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Okay. The agenda was well planned. Uh, to focus on the real work of the board, I think probably a five. I think that's good. Board followed the agenda. I think we're doing that. Um, but would say a five. Meeting was well attended. I would say between a two and a three because there was 10 to 16 people. Um, we we're prepared for the meeting. I think so. It was a pretty quiet group tonight. So maybe three. Um, no distractions. Five. Is this how I'm supposed to say it? Just go through every single one? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> um, decision making processes were understood. Yes. Four. Diversity of viewpoints were sought out and considered. Um, yes, five. Participation was balanced. Three. Um, members listened attentively. Four. Meeting participants treated each other with respect and courtesy. Five. Work was accomplished in an atmosphere of trust and openness. Five. Um, board actions occur at the policy level. Oh, is this part of it? Yeah. Yeah, that moves on to a to a second one. This next page, do I do that too or no? Um, that's like a different thing. Well, that's more of a policy governance evaluation. The first one is more of a regular meeting evaluation. Yeah. I think that just the meeting one is pretty good. So I thought it was good today. So far, we're kind of ahead of schedule, I think. Yes, we are. So maybe we should. Yeah, and maybe I'm I'm hoping that maybe during our training too, I can get some input into how we might want to do the meeting evaluations and whether to make it more effective because I think no one wants to do it. And oftentimes I don't know how useful the feedback is. And if it's just, you know, if we're doing something, we, we should be getting something out of it. So hopefully we can talk a little bit about that um, as well. So I don't uh, think it's, I don't, go ahead. I don't think it's awful. I think it's, I mean, I've done it the last two times and I think they're good points. I mean, we know pretty much the one meeting where we got off track kind of just crazy, but um, for the most part, the the key points are useful, I think. I, I mean, it seems to me, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. Can I ask a question? Cause it was in the board agenda, but we never discussed it was the school calendar. Is that a final calendar or is that a calendar that I just don't understand? Yes, it is the final calendar for school for next year. It was sent to the state, has to be there by April 1st. So that's our final. Yeah, that, that calendar is a quirky one in that because we are the, we own the regional technical center, um, that one gets determined and, and voted on by all the sending schools because that calendar controls what all the other schools have to do. 
Um, so that's, that's a pretty long process. And this year it was a much more difficult process because of COVID, um, trying to get get that out there. So I just included it because I didn't know if you guys had it or not. I think it's on the website, but figured you might as well have a copy. <laughs> yeah, I, I hadn't seen it yet. And I, I did have kind of a question as to the two days, like why they're going for two days and then have four days off. And like what the start to me just seemed a little bit, so yeah. the usually it wasn't my they, calendar. <laughs> I, I have to pull I have to pull the calendar up to answer specifically. But usually what they try to do, um, you know, we've been that was one of the pieces of language that we were hoping to get changed was to get the all the PD days front loaded at the beginning. So we didn't have things breaking up. But in discussions with the other other superintendents and with the cabinet here is what they try to do is get kind of a staggered start to the kids, you know, if they can, it's, you know, it's it's three days the first week, four days the next week, and then a full week after that to kind of ease them back into the transition. I don't know if that's actually really helpful. They they truly believe that it is. So I, I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing it. There's also under the current contract, um, there are things that are spelled out about where professional development days, especially those full professional professional development days have to fall, um, maybe part of it. But I'm happy to pull it up and look at it but if you want, if you give me a moment. No, it's, it's fine. It's just, like yeah. I said, it just seemed kind of like this, the stop start that to me. It is, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. That That's why we were, were hoping to get all the PD days right, right at the front of the year. So before the kids even start, they're done, they're out of the way, and then it's just a smooth year. Um, the professional development's also beneficial to have up front like that too because you want the teachers using it with the kids in the classroom right so it doesn't make any sense to have those pd days at the end of the year because then you know they're not able to put it into practice and, and get the maximum benefit out of it so when you're saying pd that that i'm equating to the in-service days is that correct professional development yeah sorry about that yeah beat me up if i'm using the lingo it's fine so I have just a process question. So um, thank you, Linda, for including this. But is this a board function to approve this? Or no, it's not. Yeah. OK, because I felt like this coming up calendar was was certainly um, long. You are, you're welcome to work on it if you'd like. <laughs> uh, I was just surprised. I, I too, kind of had initial feelings on it. And I wasn't sure if we had a say, but if we don't, then we don't. And I'll stop talking. Yeah. A lot of people have says, right, Lane? I mean, other schools, administrators. Yeah. I mean, I start with a basic and then you guys do whatever to it. So yeah, seven different, seven different, uh, seven different schools. So it, it encompasses quite a bit. Of course, they're all consolidated now. Yeah. Yeah. So good question. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to move into an executive session. Is that for a personnel issue? Yeah. And, and Anne, can somebody take minutes? Um, because Hannah would be the person to do that. I, I put that um, the minute form in the packet. And also, I need you to stop by tomorrow to sign contracts and diplomas. Okay. And diplomas. <laughs> Okay, good night, guys. Okay. All right, so I'll switch over to actually, you guys have to move to move into. Sorry about that. Okay. Chelsea just left, so now we're not a quorum. Oh, oh, one, two, three. Yeah, there's five of you. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, that's true. Sorry. Yeah, because uh, Rachel's still here. Good. Um, so I'll move that we enter executive session at 8.30 p.m. to discuss the personnel issue. We have a second. Ashley's going to second. All those in favor? Aye. Do we have to, do we have to vote on it? I guess so. Aye. <laughs> you should, yeah. All right. We're moving in. So we now need to adjourn the meeting. Or do we say nothing was decided? Yeah, you have to declare there was no no motions. Okay. Do I do no that vote. as the chair? 
person? Yeah. Okay. So there was no motions in the executive session. And uh, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. And do we have a second? Rachel, thank you. All right. All those in favor? Okay. Have a good good evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.